let's get right into it. We've got another one. This time I'm playing against a 2300 rated player and another Alakine. And this is one of the star variations in the text. And in fact, I've, I've played this same idea set and won so many games with it, it's second nature. If white falls into the trap, then essentially you have a one game, you just need the technique to win it at that point. And let's get to this position first, talk about it. Because after c4, for a long time it was thought that the exchange variation gave black the most problems in the alakine. And I would say from a theoretical standpoint, if we're talking, we both have engines, we both have database at our, at our disposal, we both have infinite time, say correspondence game style. I believe the four pawns attack gives the Alakine the most difficulties. But for practical over the board chess, I don't believe the four pawns attack is the best option to play against the Alakine, simply because there's so many lines you have to remember. The majority of them are good for white, but when it's a lot of theory, you don't get to play a lot of games with it due to the Alakine. Like an E4 player, I would say in 10 games, you're going to face the Alakine once or twice. The majority of the games are going to be E5, Sicilian, French, Karakhan. So, four pawns attack, what do I recommend if you're playing white? The classical gets a solid just tiny little edge, black gets a lot of pieces kept on the board, some imbalances. Black's playing from the hole in a lot of the best positions in the classical, but it's definitely a playable position. Look at the games of Grandmaster Bortnik. He wins with black all the time against excellent competition in those positions. So without further ado, the exchange variation. It was thought to be, you know, just smacking the Alakine around, especially the C takes D6 variation. And I should note the difference between C takes D6 and E takes D6. E takes D6 is a favorite of Bortnik, and his games are excellent in that. I do have a chapter on that in my Alakine course. But then I've always preferred the more aggressive C takes D6 line. And White did play the optimal setup here, Rook C1, and then B3. And this position was supposed to be snapshot, what you get is white. This is supposed to be fantastic for white. And there's a lot of moves here for black. And I want to give a, a, a few of these on how white is better and how theory was basically pointing to black getting smacked around for a while here. So let's start with knight c6. I believe this is the most popular move in the database and white wins like 60 plus percent of the games. So this isn't it. And the reason is white's able to play d5. Stopping the knight from going to g4. Well, if you insist, you can get there. And after knight g2, e e5. And I mean, to me, I see terribly weak pawns in the structure. And white having the ability at some point to play bishop d4 taking away the bishop pair. I've got a backwards pawn forever. It's understandable why white's doing very well in this position. So knight c6 is out. Well, what about e5? I know this was recommended by at least one author. I know Lakdawalla recommended it in his Alakine book many years ago. But I've never been a big fan of this position because after takes, 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 c5, and after bishop c4, you can play with the engine here, and the engine may say, you know, you're, you're holding on and all that, but I, even a, a game from 2004 from Michael Adams shows in this position that White can just continue to press, has, has a slight edge, and I think it's a relatively easy position to play. So one move that I played for a while that I thought was interesting was f5. But then as engines got stronger, I looked at a game from the US Championship, let's say from many years ago, and it was Fedorowicz 
and Shabalov. And after f5, knight h3. And let's see, it's coming up in the Lee Chess database. Yeah, Fedorowicz, Shabalov, 2008. And though Shabalov won the game, uh, already white has a big edge with this knight h3 idea. And after takes, 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 c5. And I'm not so worried about knight on the edge of the board because you're getting this nice positional squeeze. And if black doesn't go for this early e5 idea, we can put a clamp down if we get in d5, knight f4, etc. And anytime white is able to accomplish this d5 move, bishop d4 at some point is going to make that trade and get rid of that strong bishop. So what do we do in this position? Well, the reason knight c6 was the main line for so many years was because black's hoping for knight f3, followed by bishop g4, and then he gets in d5, so white can. And the dream is to get this position where white has allowed this pawn structure. We've gotten rid of our bad bishop. Notice how we've negotiated the pawns to be in agreement with our dark square bishop. That's a target. And all of our pieces come to bear on d4, where positionally we're just winning. So that was the dream. But as I showed to you after knight c6, white simply has d5. So I was analyzing this position in 2018 and was looking at the online games of Hikaru Nakamura when he was playing this position and occasionally he would play this move bishop f5 and I would see that a lot of the time white would play knight f3 then we're able to play bishop g4 and even with the extra move this is still an ideal position as we'll see and the plan is still the same so even with the throwing away a move, pitching a move for black we're still going to make it to our ideal position. And of course, if you're interested in all the different theoretical variations White has his disposal there other than knight f3, you can take a look at the text on chessable. So bishop e2 and d5. It's important to get this bishop off of the c8 square. So after d5, c5, our knight has c8 to drop back to. And we're getting our dream position here. And it doesn't matter much what plan white goes with because we're piling up on d4 just the same here. And it should be noted we're just completely dominant over here. But let's say if I had wasted a move somehow. It's still not an issue with this knight going to the edge of the board because we have the c4 square, just as a, a side note. So knight f5, and we see this beautiful harmony of the pieces. And now it's a black to play and push white over the edge a bit here. Hopefully you found queen f6, because there's just too many pieces attacking d4. And my opponent played b5. And we get mass liquidation. So the next step here is we're a pawn up, but it is a bishop of opposite color. Middle game. We still have the queens on the board. So the only thing that could really hurt us is the potential of a pass pawn. But in the long term, especially if we trade bishops, the passer is going to do it for us. So if that is the biggest if that is the biggest threat with the passer, let's go ahead and focus on corralling the pawn before it can get dangerous. So understandably, my opponent isn't having any of that. He gets his pawn rolling. And notice why I put the queen on f4. One, we do have the potential of playing bishop e5 at some point. And then also our queen is keeping an eye on c7 so this pawn doesn't get 
too dangerous for us to have to deal with. So I go rook c7, staying flexible. No, no real hurry here. Bishop b2 makes a lot of sense because the pawn isn't going to be very easy to push. And this bishop can definitely come to a6 to stop the other rook from coordinating. So bishop e5, just over protection of the rook on c7, and trying to make some weaknesses in the structure. So queen f5, like I said, just you make some holes, you can work around it. Bishop d6 improves the bishop, keeping an eye on both wings. So understandably, my opponent goes for that. Check. And I was happy to get this because I understood that in the long term here, more than likely, I am going to give a rook for the bishop and pawn, and I feel good about my chances in that position. And the extra thing to keep in mind here is notice the time management. I'm comfortable in this position. I'm winning a pawn currently. I've got two minutes of my initial three and my opponent only has one. So I'm comfortable and my speed's not really gonna change. Bishop c5, not going back to d6 because the bishop is well placed where it can anchor on the b6 square and keep an eye on the base pawn. If the base pawn falls, the chain falls. So bishop b7, rook b8, and because of my opponent's time situation, I'm not just going to take the bishop immediately. I can take the bishop at any point in time. This is one of those patience in in-game technique. If you can do it immediately or do it in 10 moves, you want to do it in 10 moves and try to improve your position in the meantime. So I dance my king over to the optimal square. If we're going to be pushing the pawns in the center, I definitely want my king involved in the ending. I see that the white king could potentially come in, and I don't want any of that. Getting my pawn center moving keeps the king completely out. Now, finally, after I've improved my position as much as I can, only now do I make the sacrifice. Attacking the pawn, let's simply move it. The rook's not on the best square. Rooks are meant to be on open files. Both rooks bothering the pawn, so let's simply move it. Notice how the rooks can't be rooks. King e5, no problems here. This is why it was important earlier to anchor the bishop. Now e3 can be a threat as well. And after king g1, king c4, and my opponent had enough as he had roughly six seconds left. So overall, we had a little survey in the exchange variation of the Alakine defense and somewhat of a model game for black with this key idea early of the stutter step with bishop f5 followed by bishop g4 and we get the ideal structure trading off the bishop where we see the complete harmony attacking d4. And if a 2300 lead chess rated player is making this mistake, and I've seen it happen so often that I don't believe I've ever had a GM fall in this but I definitely can find games where I've beaten a few IMs from this position, especially in one minute, because you don't have time to think about this. And unless you're actively studying Alakine theory, you'll run into this positional trap. So hopefully you enjoyed this game and got a little something out of it.